Jennifer Wilbanks became a national news figure overnight after her disappearance from the home she shared with fiancé John Mason in Georgia on the evening of April 26, 2005. Three days later, Jennifer surfaced some 1,400 miles away. Initial reports of her abduction turned out to have been made up by Jennifer herself, and the whole affair was determined to be simply a case of a bride-to-be having second thoughts. The media dubbed Jennifer the runaway bride, and the intense news coverage of the story itself became a source of criticism as a particularly insidious example of lowbrow media exploitation. But why did the story become as big as it did? What was the real story behind the tabloid product? And who was the unwitting participant at the center of it all? Jennifer Wilbanks. Behind this crazy, crazy story, there's a person. Most outlets who've covered the story tend to accept tabloid portrayals of Jennifer at face value. A closer look at the facts of the case, however, shows us that the truth may not be as simple as People magazine would have us believe. Today, we're going to take a deep dive and reopen the case of The Runaway Bride. <laughs> On the evening of Tuesday, April 26, 2005, around 8.30 p.m., Jennifer Wilbanks told her fiancé, John Mason, she was going for an evening jog. The couple were living together in John's home in Duluth, and their wedding was planned for that Saturday. Jennifer was an avid runner, and according to John, did not maintain a particularly consistent exercise routine. So he didn't think it especially out of the ordinary when she told him she planned to run until she got tired. However, as the hours passed and Jennifer did not come back, John became worried. And I went out looking for her and never found her anywhere. Um, I drove all around the area here that I could think of that she might have been. He was telling me to come by her office today. She had a list of all the vendors for the wedding and their numbers cell phone numbers in case. The mother and daughter had talked just a few hours before Jennifer disappeared. She said, Mama, you're going to be with me all day. She left out of here uh, with just a radio and her clothes that she had on. Uh, there were cell phones in there, credit cards, her pocketbook, her money, her keys, her car, uh, her diamond, every, everything that she owns is in the home. Um, this is cold feet. It's the weirdest case of cold feet I've ever seen. The family called in a missing persons report. And by the following afternoon, police and volunteers had mobilized search efforts. About the only thing Duluth police can tell us about Jennifer Wilbanks' disappearance is that they know very little about her disappearance. At that point, we still had no indication that a crime has been committed. At this point, we still had no indication that a crime has been committed. Keep in our prayer. Good, please. But when word spread that Wilbanks had vanished without a trace, volunteers came out of the woodwork to help find her. More than 220 joining with police to spread the word or search for clues, but nothing. But we are treating it at, as a criminal investigation as of now. Wilbanks' family says she left for her run, leaving all her worldly possessions behind. Friends say she was looking forward to her Saturday wedding without any second thoughts. With few clues, all cops can do now is expand their search. We were trying to uh, search areas in which we thought that she was going to run in. Uh, we understand now that she, uh, she possibly is a marathon runner. So based on that information, we're going to extend the search area uh, out from where we searched yesterday. Jennifer Wilbanks' father couldn't sit by idly, spending the day with the searchers looking for clues, a hard day after a sleepless night. I may have slept two hours if that much. It's, uh, you know, everything goes through your head, wondering what you could do, what should we do, wondering, you know, where Jennifer is. <laughs> if she's scared, hurt, or, or what. High school student like Katie Fagan kind of, is, like is doing her car. part. I was passing out these flyers and um, I was getting the teachers to hang them up in their rooms. I 
we may do a control search uh, later on today with uh, police professionals looking for any evidence that may be there that may have been overlooked by some civilian volunteers. The volunteer search was officially called off before dusk, but a few determined searchers kept on as night began to fall. High school student Katie Fagan and friend hung signs around Old Town Duluth, just a few blocks from where 32-year-old Jennifer Wilbanks lives with her fiancé, John Mason. I was out here for five hours yesterday, and I've been uh, passing out flyers in my school all day today and all to all the teachers, to all the students, and I tried to get a group together to make these signs so we could go around and post them. Meantime, searchers turned up a variety of items stretching from here to Forsyth County, including two sweatshirts, a pair of sweatpants, and a clump of human hair. Yeah, until the tests come back, whether there is any evidence of a crime, uh, we don't know yet. We're still waiting on the crime lab to tell us you know, whether the clothing we picked up belonged to her or not. So uh, right now, we still have nothing. Everything's been called off tonight. Everybody needs a rest tonight. We Can't hold out hope that she is still alive and that she can be returned. It'd be great if she could be returned in time for the wedding on Saturday, but you know that that just remains to be seen. Day two of the search ended much like day one, with no sign of Jennifer Wilbanks. The story quickly went nationwide after it was picked up by cable news. For three days, speculation abounded. Was she kidnapped by a stranger and possibly murdered? Some wondered if it couldn't be a simple case of pre-wedding jitters. Jennifer comes from a very good family. She would never run off because she's getting married, or she was so excited about being married, getting married this weekend. It's the cold feet. It's the weirdest case of cold feet I've ever seen. Never, but if you know Jennifer, that's not what happened. She was so excited about this wedding. But her abrupt disappearance without a trace suggested something more nefarious was at play. Did something insidious occur between Jennifer and John? John, for his part, was eager to grant interview requests restate his innocence, and plea for her return. Investigators announced Mason has volunteered to take a polygraph, but they do not know when. It's routine. You know, I mean, we would do that in this type of case, uh, you know, get someone a polygraph. Three computers taken from the home of Will Banks and fiancé John Mason are being analyzed. Investigators say they want to see if Will Banks had any unusual conversations or emails from anyone before her disappearance. The families of missing Jennifer Wilbanks and her fiancé John Mason marched up to the microphones together, a show of family solidarity in a dark hour. They offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of anyone involved in the 32-year-old bride-to-be's disappearance. The families have come together and are supporting each other. We're doing that through our faith, through our friends, and through prayer. We cannot describe the emotional effect the situation places on our family. We apologize if we have seemed distant, uh, but I think it's a natural uh, occurrence. We love Jennifer very much. <laughs> we would give our life and everything that we own to have her return. We know that the investigators are working very hard and, and they're doing a lot of work behind the scenes that we're not involved in and shouldn't be involved in. We support them and everything they're doing. The police chief seemed frustrated. They had not been able to do their own polygraph on Mason. The conditions that Mr. Watkins has put upon us is not normal for the GBI or the FBI to do for a polygraph. But John Mason's lawyer says the videotaping is a standard procedure in many polygraph tests and would protect the integrity of the test. The private test this morning, he says, was videotaped. He passed. The phone rang at the home of Joyce and Roger Parrish around 1.30 in the morning on Saturday, April 30th, the day of the intended wedding. It was Jennifer calling collect from a payphone off Route 66 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She told her family she'd been abducted but had been let go and was unharmed. Jennifer called 911 and was brought to the Albuquerque Police Station. She was Jennifer Wilbanks. We have confirmed that that is who we have. It's a possibility that she was dropped off here 
and released, and all that is still uh, being investigated. So at this time, she is here. She is with police. She is. Uh, doesn't it appear to be any life-threatening injuries? We are going to get her medical attention, and we will be talking to her in the next couple hours. Jennifer's family held a press conference that morning to share the news of Jennifer's return. stepdad answered the telephone and he came and got me and I talked with her on the phone until we could get the police to her and the police have got her now and, and we're going this morning. I said, hey baby, is that you? And she said, yeah. And I said, I love you. And she said, I love you too. I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I'm fine. Just, I'm scared. You know, she was scared and crying and didn't know where she was. I was crying, I was laughing, I was trying to stay calm to talk to her to keep her calm and it's just so much and it's, you kind of have to keep yourself composed because she didn't know where she was and she was scared to death. I just, my feelings are just praise the Lord. Uh, God is good, he's alive, he's real, he answers prayers, he, he's bringing my baby back to me. John Mason is overjoyed that his fiance Jennifer Wilbanks is alive and well. Her friends and family gathered at the Wilbanks house once news filtered down that Jennifer was safe and sound. Our family is just so ecstatic. Uh, I was so worried about my mom and dad. If, if we got some uh, terrible, terrible news, I was, just, I was just worried about them making it through it. So uh, it's a happy time. It's just incredible. It's a miracle. Strong faith in God, a lot of prayers. It was really at that time that she decided to um, tell the truth about the entire incident. But authorities say Wilbanks finally confessed she had taken a bus to Las Vegas and then on to Albuquerque. She had even cut her hair. Her family learned all of this in the middle of an interview with Channel yeah. 2. Okay, I'm sorry. well, I've got to I've, I've got to <laughs> Jennifer Wilbanks' father, Harris, was doing a live interview with Channel 2 when the FBI pulled him away to give him the news, the real news. Jennifer was a runaway bride. She is basically. Uh, Got in cold feet and she, she left and went to Albuquerque. Surprise, he's surprised for the, for the family. What was their reaction? I think it was a surprise for everybody. They immediately retreated into John's home only to reemerge hours later in a white SUV headed to the airport. Meanwhile, at the Albuquerque police station, the press had begun to descend outside. Ms. Wilbanks informed agents and detectives that she had not been abducted as she had originally claimed. Officer Trish Hoffman informed Jennifer of the situation. The sergeant that called me said, you're not gonna believe who we have in the back of our police car. And I was like, who? Then they said the girl from Georgia, and I knew immediately um, who she was. It'd been all over the news. Possibly the first time the magnitude of her circumstances begins to occur to her. And then I remember thinking, boy, it's really gonna be a bigger deal even now, because now she had made up all this information and now she had lied about it. Albuquerque officer Trish Hoffman reads a brief prepared statement from Jennifer. I respect the fact that, that the public deserves a statement. Um, however, please re request, or she's requesting that um, she would like to speak to her family first. I appreciate the outpouring of prayers and concern and that she has recently become aware of. Officer Hoffman offers Jennifer a blanket to cover herself as she is escorted to the Albuquerque airport and put on a plane back to Georgia. To me, that made it into sort of a perp walk, uh, made it seem like she was some sort of criminal. Jennifer Wilbank sits in an Atlanta police cruiser Saturday night after getting off her flight from Albuquerque, and she is whisked away to her home in Duluth. Oh, I think she's been through a lot. Fellow passengers on board the flight from Albuquerque say everyone was talking about the runaway bride. Uh, I think they're just filled with curiosity about her plight and where she's been and how she got to Albuquerque. As details continue to emerge, that Jennifer's abduction story involved false claims of sexual assault. Jennifer, is there anything you want to say before you get on the plane? And that her fictitious captor was Hispanic. We all have to coexist, but for her to single out a Hispanic male was wrong. The story became a tabloid sensation. At the same time, public outrage began to surface from different corners. I was relieved that she was okay because I really felt like there's no way this could be a case of cold feet. Many saw her actions as selfish and grossly inconsiderate. But then my second reaction was, how could anybody do this to their mom and dad? I just don't understand. And um, why not just let someone know, even if it was your maid of honor? 
In Duluth, estimates of the costs for her search fueled public pressure on Mayor Shirley Lassiter to press charges against Jennifer. On May 9th, Jennifer was admitted for inpatient care. During her stay, a deal was made with Regan Media for the exclusive rights to the couple's life stories. The news that Jennifer had made a profit of $500,000 for a potential book deal added fuel to the public indignation. While the book never materialized, the package also reportedly included Jennifer and John's NBC interview with Katie Couric. The segment, filmed while she was still under inpatient care, remains Jennifer's only on-camera interview to date. During the interview, Jennifer and John confirmed they are still engaged, but that the wedding is postponed indefinitely. The two would ultimately separate the following year. The runaway bride appeared to have finally found marital bliss in 2010, when her engagement to landscaping designer Greg Hudson was picked up by the tabloids. Since the 10th anniversary of Jennifer's disappearance, retrospectives on the runaway bride resurface in mainstream media and the occasional true crime channel every couple years. The incident remains a fleeting but deeply embedded moment in U.S. pop culture history. In recent times, Jennifer's story has drawn comparisons to Sherry Papini, another young woman who disappeared mysteriously, only to later be found to have staged her own abduction. That both women chose to identify their imaginary captors as Hispanic adds in another parallel. So why did the story of the runaway bride take off the way it did? We can start by considering the state of the 24-hour cable news cycle at the time. By 2005, Fox News, MSNBC, and Headline News were posing real competition against CNN, the first network to successfully implement the format nationally. The Missing Pretty Woman was already a tried-and-true storyline for this format. Aside from feeding an expanding public fascination with true crime content, it easily filled airtime and offered viewers in the U.S. a diversion from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The disappearance of Lacey Peterson on December 24, 2002, and the media sensation around the murder trial of her husband Scott Peterson firmly planted the missing pretty woman trope in the public's news diet. More recently, the November 22, 2003 disappearance of 22-year-old Drew Shodine in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and 19-year-old Brooke Wilberger in Corvallis, Oregon, on May 25, 2004, had resulted in the worst fears realized. Both college students would eventually be found to have been murdered, only after months of their loved ones holding on to blind hope without answers. 18-year-old Natalie Holloway, would disappear during a trip to Aruba a month after Jennifer's reemergence on May 30th. Her remains have not been found as of posting this. The networks had worked out another element that made coverage even more engaging, while simultaneously offering plausible denial against any insinuations of exploitation. By no small coincidence, authoritative female commentators such as Nancy Grace on CNN. We are waiting for a press conference scheduled for this hour. We'll take you there live as soon as that conference begins. Greta Van Susteren on Fox News. John Vandersloot told us on tape that he sold Natalie Holloway on a beach in Aruba for about $10,000. Well, you're on now says he was lying to us. Along with Rita Cosby. A stunning new twist tonight in the mysterious murder of a New Jersey chemist. We're positioned as leading the coverage and symbolically the search for justice. The networks found the collision of strong female on-air personalities and voiceless victims whose beauty remained frozen in a photo, cost-effective and popular with audiences. And while legacy network news and mainstream print journalism had worked to differentiate themselves from the tabloids, the demands of the 24-hour news cycle continued to blur the line between the paparazzi and correspondence. Adding to the drama of Jennifer's disappearance was the upcoming wedding. Suspicion of John's involvement in her disappearance remained an intriguing theory. The Duluth police chief says Mason planned to tell investigators today whether he'll agree to take a polygraph test. But it must lead your ears to go up a little bit when you hear the, the fiancé say, I'm going to wait a day. In spite of, or perhaps even because of his willingness to field interviews and work with the police. I'm getting through, man. Yeah. Yeah, faith. That's all I got left. Some saw connections in their minds to Scott Peterson's public relations efforts. Amber Fry came mm -hmm. forward. I'm glad she did. You are? Definitely. Why? It's the appropriate thing to do. And it really shows what a person of character she is. Um, and it allows us to um, 
get back looking for Lacey. I know there's been a lot of these high profile cases and I think it's tend to make it makes people like us in the media somewhat cynical and suspicious. It may, maybe are we too quick to, to start thinking this person, that person, this one needs a polygraph. Could it be a simple case of, of, of cold feet? After Jennifer turned up, the anticipated best case outcome of the rescued damsel, or the heroine, was quickly subverted when news of the abduction hoax immediately followed. It's gotta be a crime. It's gotta be a crime. It's got to be a crime! It's got to be, because if it doesn't, we're gonna look like a bunch of dumbasses. For a moment, producers, anchors, and correspondents needed to regroup after their expectations had been defied. Anchors throughout the week make comments like, I couldn't believe it when I heard Saturday morning that she turned up alive, with an indignant tone that almost suggested disappointment. Many of the same strident female voices on CNN and Fox were now leading the ire and scorn against Jennifer. In the elaborate and specific lies runaway bride Jennifer Wilbanks told police before admitting she ran away from her wedding. Facts in about my mind the this tragic whole time. consequences. In some corners, Jennifer was seen as a hero, an almost inadvertent feminist icon who went against the rules. Running away from the wedding is unfortunately more common than you would think. Um, and for all those who don't get on the bus or get on the plane, they've been thinking about it. Rachel Safir, whose website, There Goes the Bride, knows all too well. She's an almost bride herself. Meanwhile, Jennifer's escapades had become a punchline among late night talk show hosts and other comedy outlets. What about the runaway bride? The runaway bride, were you, were you following that story? I was following, I, that guy's the luckiest guy in the world. Why's that? The crazy woman left. She said that the woman revealed her craziness before the marriage. Yeah. Uh, this weekend, obviously, everybody was talking about this Jennifer Wilbanks of Duluth, Georgia. But you know what's weird? It's like they had a picture like on, on newspapers and everything. We got to find this woman. We got to find this woman. And uh, what's it? Chandra Levy was missing. We got to find this woman. Right. We got to find her. Uh, what's the Lacey Peterson? Where is she? Right. No, w no one cares about missing men. Never it's it like way. when a man's missing, nobody cares. A kid's missing, Amber Alert. Men, it's like, Bob didn't come home last night. Ms. Wilbanks ran off to Albuquerque by way of Las Vegas. It was a little embarrassing for her, but uh, thankfully not a tra uh, tragedy. There was no story there. None. Oh, I'm sorry, CNN, you're going to keep this thing going? You have an update for us? Can you give us an idea? I know the towel's over her head, but what is your sense of her uh, state of mind right now? Others seek to cash in on her notoriety. For a time, the runaway bride was enough of a fixture of popular culture that a handful of enterprising folks came up with some imaginative tie-ins. There was stuff on eBay for sale, like original copies of the flyer for sale. The original Jennifer Wilbanks runaway bride kit was sold on eBay for $102.50. It included hair dye, sunglasses, scissors, a clip-on hair extension, and a DVD of The Runaway Bride. Pappy's Peppers of Lawrenceville, Georgia, came out with Jennifer's High Tail and Hot Sauce. Toymaker Hero Builders issued a run of 12-inch Runaway Bride dolls. That doll also came with a striped towel, similar to the one Jennifer used to cover her head. Someone offered me $10,000 for that blanket. And you know, I joked at the time and I thought, oh my gosh, if that blanket was worth $10,000, I, I should have thought and put like my police jacket on top of her head. At a Gwinnett Gladiators hockey game on March 5th, 2006, 1,000 bobblehead figures of a jogger wearing a bridal veil were given out within 10 minutes. A piece of toast said to bear the image of Jennifer's face famously sold on eBay for $15,400, though the winning bidder never actually paid. On March 15, 2007, a rock opera based on Jennifer's story was staged at the Red Clay Theater in Duluth. The Albuquerque police referenced the incident in a recruitment campaign in 2011. Even Tom Smiley, the pastor of Lakewood Baptist Church in Gainesville, who'd read Jennifer's statement to the press on the family's behalf, wasn't above marketing his proximity to the case with his book, Runaway Lives. Jennifer was christened the runaway bride in the media, and references to the 1999 Julia Roberts film that inspired the name were frequent. In the film, Roberts' character Maggie has a pattern of ditching out on fiancés, enough so that the tabloids start calling her the runaway bride. Maggie's behavior is framed as a pathology, and it takes the more well-grounded man, in this case, 
a journalist covering her, played by Richard Gere, to deconstruct her cognitive distortions and help her get past herself. By contrast, in films from the classic era of screwball comedies like It Happened One Night or even the 1930 film The Runaway Bride, the bride-to-be fleeing her wedding was framed as liberating and empowering. Another area of confusion the media faced in reconciling Jennifer's story arc was the lack of another man in the mix to more neatly tie up her motive. Jennifer was clearly running from a wedding, but had no to. When she bought her bus ticket the week prior to her disappearance, Jennifer states she'd chosen Austin after seeing Matthew McConaughey in an interview talking about his hometown. I wasn't going there to find Matthew McConaughey. I was watching that and I was like, oh. That's, I'll go to Austin, Texas. She then began looking up information on the city online and finding the ranches and national parks particularly attractive. In Gwinnett County, the public became particularly sore. Most folks in Duluth don't seem to have a lot of sympathy for Jennifer Wilbanks. Generally speaking, we're very angry. Do you feel a little sorry for her? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Not really. Why? Her husband thought she was dead. You know, I, I don't even have any thoughts on it. Everybody's disappointed. We're shocked. Um, we love Jennifer. You know, we, we want to help her. We want her to get help. She needs to pay some consequences for this. This isn't cute. There definitely needs to be some sort of, you know, consequence to this action. It's a childish, immature, attention-wanting action. I think one of the stages uh, of that is being mad or being upset, and then you go past that to uh, working it out and healing, and I think we'll all get there. The estimated $43,000 cost of the search became a hot topic among the community. Her office has been flooded with emails from people saying Wilbank should be made to repay the city or do community service. Mayor Lassiter says, just give it time. We need for her to heal and find out what is going on. Obviously, what the reward was set up for, no one really can claim it, but if the family does have the money, then maybe they could pay for some of the costs. The mayor of Duluth, Georgia, has this to add. She says the television show, A Current Affair, asked her to broker a $100,000 deal with the couple for an exclusive interview. That 100000 would be given to the city to cover the expense. It's the mayor said no to the deal. A current affair says no comment. After Mayor Lassiter had already turned down an offer, the news that Jennifer had gotten a half million dollar book deal added to public pressure on Mayor Lassiter to hold Jennifer accountable. Given the national attention the story had drawn, the mayor had other considerations to weigh as well. Just two months earlier, at 8.45 a.m. on March 11, 2005, during an appearance at Fulton County Courthouse for a retrial on rape and other charges, 33-year-old Brian Nichols attacked a deputy while being unhandcuffed and was able to retrieve the key to her gun locker. He grabbed the gun, held several people hostage as he tried to find Judge Roland Barnes in his private chambers. He was able to obtain a second gun from another deputy, entered the courtroom from the rear, and shot Judge Barnes in the back of the head, along with court reporter Julie Brandau. That man, caught on surveillance camera escaping down a stairwell. While escaping on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Nichols shot Sheriff's Deputy Hoyt Teasley several times. Through a string of carjackings, he managed to stay under the radar. Around 10.45 that evening, he shot off-duty ICE agent David Wilhelm taking his gun, badge, and pickup. With the city of Atlanta and the entire state of Georgia on high alert, at 2 o'clock in the morning, a 26-year-old single mom pulled up to her apartment complex in the Atlanta suburb of Duluth. 26-year-old Ashley Smith was at a rough spot in her life when her path crossed with Nichols. Ashley had been struggling with addiction since her teens. She'd seen her husband stabbed to death in a drug deal gone wrong and had since lost custody of their daughter due to her ongoing methamphetamine use. She had just moved into her new apartment in Duluth, and after a night of unpacking, made a trip to the convenience store for cigarettes. When she came back around 2.30 that morning, Nichols followed her into the building, and now armed with three guns, he said, have you been watching the news? held her hostage over seven hours. Nichols asked Ashley if she had any marijuana. She didn't, but offered Nichols meth she still had from the night before. Nichols calmed down after snorting the meth and the two began talking about their lives and problems. I kind of thought, okay, if I treat him like a human being, not like somebody that just killed somebody, then maybe he'll let me go. At one point, 
Ashley reportedly read a passage from the Christian self-help book, The Purpose Driven Life, that was especially impactful on Nichols. Nichols then asked what Ashley Smith thought his purpose was. She said to go to jail, pay for what he did, and try to minister people in prison. She had gained his trust enough that he allowed her to leave the apartment to see her daughter, with the agreement he could lay low at her place for a few days. For most of the night, he told me I wasn't going to be able to go, but about 8 o'clock the next morning, somewhere around there, he just looked at me and he said, what time do you need to leave to see your little girl? You know, I jokingly looked at my watch and I was like, now? Now would be a great time for me to just get out of here. Um, and and he, he just let me go. Instead, Ashley called 911, and a SWAT team took Nichols into custody without incident. Um, Brian Nichols uh, came to my house at 2 o'clock last night. Emails advising that Brian Nichols is in her apartment, and she ran out. The victim is advising that he is in the apartment at this time. There are three weapons underneath the bed. He's advising he's wanting to turn himself in. We can confirm that Gwinnett County's SWAT team has Brian Nichols in custody. Ashley was celebrated for her poise and control under extreme duress, resulting in a peaceful outcome to a tragic murder spree. She would cite the experience as solidifying her faith in Jesus and the catalyst to finally overcome her addiction. And it, I said, and I felt his spirit, and I said, you know what, no, I'm not going to do those drugs, and I'm never going to do them again because they've ruined my life. And it was an immediate, immediate just release. So I got my key to my to my house um, ready. So I put my key in the door and I unlocked it and I turned around and he was right there. So I uh, um, I asked him if I could read. He said, "What do you want to read?" I said, "Well, I have a book in my room." And so I went and got it. I got my Bible. And I got a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Mm. I turned it to the chapter that I was on that day, which was chapter 33. And I started to read the first paragraph of it. After I read it, he said, stop. Well, you read it again. I said, yeah, I'll read it again. So I read it again to him. <clears throat> it mentioned something about what you thought your purpose in life was, but after we began to talk and he said he thought that I was an angel sent from God and that I was his sister and he was my brother in Christ and that he was lost and God led him right to me. When I followed him to pick to, to take the truck, I felt like he was going to, he was really going to turn himself in um, because when you when you take action and you make a mistake, you pay for it. You pay for it, and that's when you make that action. When you take that action, you are you're you're ultimately saying, "I accept the responsibility or the punishment that goes along with it." I mean, you could not have been more messed up. It's like you can be so messed up yeah. and so far gone, and he goes, "You know what? I have hope for you. I love you." Meanwhile, Rick Warren, evangelical pastor of Saddleback Mountain Church and author of The Purpose Driven Life, especially appreciated the role his book played in Ashley's story. The Purpose Driven Life, that book. Mm -hmm. A Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life. In this book, Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life. Pastor Rick Warren's The Purpose Driven Life. The Purpose Driven Life really changed your life. <laughs> <laughs> the spike in sales of the book led to Warren no longer drawing his salary from his church and incorporating a practice he called reverse tithing of 90% of his earnings by 2006. God gets paid first. Ashley was quickly approached with an offer from Zondervan Books, the same imprint which had published The Purpose Driven Life. Ironically, comedian Lewis Black comments on both Ashley's and Jennifer's book deals in the same Daily Show clip, albeit without appearing to fully recognize how closely the stories were connected. The hardest thing about being a tabloid instant celebrity is knowing when to cash in your chips. Because if you wait until minute 16, you can kiss that book deal goodbye. Runaway bride Jennifer Wilbanks made it in just under the wire. She's writing a book and doing a primetime interview on NBC. Movie! 
going from cashing in on fictional kidnappings to cashing in on real ones, there's Ashley Smith. She's the woman whose heroism consisted of not dying. Her upcoming book will tell the story of how she's been inspired by Christian bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life. So she's getting paid to write a book about how she read another book. The same year, Ashley shared her story on The Oprah Winfrey Show, a show that regularly featured Warren and had promoted The Purpose Driven Life through Oprah's book club. Here's the promo for that episode. An all new Oprah, you saw the headlines. Seven hours of terror. A single mom held captive by the accused Atlanta spree killer. I thought I was gonna die, really. Details you have not heard. What did he tell you to do? Tied up, terrified, her shocking admission. Immediately, I thought, what have you just done? Ashley Smith, the first in-depth interview. Next, Oprah. Ashley released her memoir, An Unlikely Angel, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Hostage Hero. The book would go on to be the basis for the 2015 dramatization, Captive. The portrait of Ashley Smith as strong. Through the power of Jesus, he began to see some strength in me. Contrasted significantly with the perception of Jennifer as weak. Adding to this was that Ashley's story had begun from a place of disadvantage. She was still struggling with addiction and trying to rebuild her life when she rose to the occasion. Jennifer, on the other hand, came from relative comfort and privilege. I had a great life, Katie. And instead chose to run from what appeared to many from the outside to be first world problems. It didn't help Mayor Lassiter that Ashley's media nickname had become the Atlanta hostage hero. We never counted on Ashley Smith. We never took that into consideration, but Ashley, with your calm demeanor and handling of the situation, with your cool-headed reasoning, you were able to overcome a very serious situation. While the runaway bride brought less favorable direct attention onto the suburb of Duluth. And I think everybody just felt like they'd been betrayed a little bit, but it's something we'll get over. It's Duluth's mayor says the folks in town might get over Jennifer Wilbanks' deceptive dash to Vegas, but the city budget might not. Officials wavered as to whether legal action would be brought, but on June 1st... Here at the Gwinnett County Jail, Jennifer Wilbanks, flanked by her attorney, Lydia Sartain, turns herself in without comment just after 10 this morning. Her fiancé, John Mason, and family arriving minutes later, again, no comment. Judge Ronnie Batchelor found Jennifer guilty of false reporting to law enforcement. Your Honor, I'm truly sorry for my actions, and I... I just want to thank the Gwinnett County and the city of Duluth for all of their efforts. Judge Ronnie Batchelor sentenced Will Banks to two years probation, 120 hours community service, and she must reimburse the sheriff's department. I thought she uh, exemplified courage and dignity in doing what she did. She didn't have to. She didn't have to pay the city of Duluth, but she did. Those were her decisions, and I respect her for that. Will Banks then went to the county jail for a routine booking procedure, then left with her attorney, possibly to resume her treatment for emotional issues. The booking, mugshot, fingerprinting, a procedural after the fact in this probation case. She was sentenced to two years probation and 120 hours of community service, along with $2,500 in restitution. In addition, she'd paid around $13,000 to the city of Duluth towards the estimated $43,000 spent on search efforts. Photos of Jennifer working community service hours were deemed fit to print alongside captions like, As mayor, Shirley led Duluth to win the nationally prestigious City of Excellence Award for Smart Zoning. In 2012, Shirley Lassiter resigned as Gwinnett County Commissioner after pleading guilty to bribery charges. Along with her son, John Fanning, Lassiter was charged with accepting $36,500 in bribes in exchange for building permits, along with alleged involvement in cocaine trafficking. Call me by my real name, Jennifer. You know, guys, behind this crazy, crazy story, there's a person. A person that's hurting, has been hurting for a long time. Jennifer Carol Wilbanks, along with her twin brother Matthew, were born February 20th, 1973, in Gainesville, 
to Harris and Joyce Woolbanks. Harris handled land management for the Georgia Department of Transportation, while Joyce was co-owner of her family's sporting goods store, Satterfields. At the age of six, Jennifer and Matthew's parents divorced. Joyce soon remarried Roger Parrish, and Harris would eventually marry Harris and Joyce reportedly co-parented with 50-50 custody. By all accounts, Jennifer was described as sociable and personable. For about 12 years, Jennifer's mother was co-owner back when the name of the hunting and fishing store was Satterfields. She was always in and out, uh, seeing her mother. That Jerry Clark worked there then and remembers Jennifer the same as most people we talked with. She was always very upbeat, uh, seemed like a very happy person. Uh, Never met a stranger, smiled a lot, and she was genuine with her smiles. This is a good family, a very well-respected family. This, this girl, um, just terrific personality, um, and um, you'd want to do this for anyone, but it hurts a little bit more when it's somebody who you know is such a great person. At North Hall High School, she was an honor student, ran varsity track. After graduating in 1991, Jennifer enrolled in the University of Georgia with a major in biology. She attended a few years but did not graduate. On May 30, 1996, Jennifer walked into the Walmart at 400 Shallowford Road. She first headed to the health and beauty section, where the loss prevention officer spotted her stowing baby aloe lotion, deodorant, and tanning lotion in her purse. He followed Jennifer to electronics, where she took a Tina Arena cassette and a VHS copy of the Alicia Silverstone comedy Clueless, while she half remembers taking a DVD in the NBC interview. I think a video, DVD. a DVD. The first commercial DVD players wouldn't have been released until November of that year. Jennifer then took an inexpensive necklace, and lastly, perhaps her most infamous stolen item, a copy of Elegant Bride magazine. What did you steal? Funny enough, a bridal magazine. Jennifer was apprehended without incident. She completed a six-week diversion program called Project Turnabout in exchange for the charges being dropped. Somewhere around this time, she'd begun dating the first man who would propose marriage to her. Were you ever engaged or ultra serious about anybody? Or um, I've been engaged before, yes. According to an article in the New York Post, the unnamed source, who stated she was presently married to him, chose herself to come forward about his time with Jennifer because he is a Christian man and he doesn't want to bash her. She states the two had dated eight to nine months before he proposed. We, we were engaged just for a, a few months before the wedding was. The plans had gone as far as picking out an engagement ring and putting it on layaway, along with browsing houses, before Jennifer abruptly broke off the relationship over the phone. The wife adds that the two had remained chaste at Jennifer's request, even though, quote, he said he was fine to have sex. She otherwise says nothing particularly detracting about Jennifer beyond what a great catch she lost out on. On October 1st, 1996, Jennifer would be arrested for a second time. Jennifer had been working at the Express Clothing Store at the Lakeshore Mall and was charged with theft by conversion after it was revealed $1,740 worth of merchandise had been stolen from the store. Jennifer would later characterize the incident as her allowing friends to take merchandise while she looked the other way. According to the considerably redacted incident report, police responded to a call from the store manager who had indicated only that Jennifer and a coworker, 28-year-old Jackie Roos, had received the stolen property over the last two weeks. The manager identified the two as ex-employees at the time of the report. She says she actually turned herself in. It's unclear if Jennifer or her cohort were on site, as the report only states that arrest warrants were sought in response. The felony charge was dropped after Jennifer completed another pretrial diversion program and paid restitution. Meanwhile, Jennifer had begun working at Northeast Georgia Medical Center as a medical assistant in the OBGYN unit in July of 1996, a job she maintained until February of 2004, after which she continued to work per diem shifts. She would be arrested once more for shoplifting on April 17, 1998 at Maurice's. A store employee noticed Jennifer taking three dresses into the fitting rooms and putting two back on the rack after coming out. When the employee confronted Jennifer, she claimed she was still browsing. The employee asked Jennifer to see a shopping bag she was carrying 
and found two $49 dresses inside which had not been paid for. Security was called, and Jennifer was again taken into custody without incident. This time Jennifer was sentenced to one year unsupervised probation, a $400 fine, and 50 hours of community service. That time you spent two weekends in jail. Right. Jennifer was able to avoid further legal trouble and maintained her employment with Northeast Georgia Medical Center for the next seven years. Jennifer had maintained a passion for running and regularly competed in races. In August 2004, she was introduced to John Mason by her aunt Shelley. John Mason's father had served as the mayor of Duluth, and John was the manager of the medical clinic his grandfather had founded. After a reported all night long phone conversation, J Jennifer told me that, that either the night before or the day after, she's like, You know, you might be coming to meet your wife. The two began dating, bonding over a shared love of running and Christianity. While making dinner one night, John gets down on one knee and pulls out a three carat solitaire diamond engagement ring. In December of that year, John proposed to Jennifer in the kitchen of his home. And she started crying. I got down on one knee and she's just crying. I was like, Come. Um, you know, will you marry me? And she's just crying. And I said, uh, I asked you a question. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice for you to answer, please. But they got engaged last August, 10 months after their first date. The couple set the date for April 30th the next year. As plans began to materialize, the bridal party had grown to 28 bridesmaids and groomsmen, and over 600 RSVPs had come in from guests. Hundreds of wedding gifts had already been received by the evening of Jennifer's disappearance on Tuesday, April 26th. From an interview with Fox News Channel to air yeah, on Hannity and Coombs. Well, we, I, I gotta be honest with you, we really haven't done a great deal of talking, talking. We've just kind of just been for the last day and a half, and it's kind of been nice. After Jennifer's return to Duluth, John announced the two would remain together, but that their engagement was postponed for the time being. Jennifer declined media requests aside from a written statement she released on May 5th, which Pastor Tom Smiley of Lakewood Baptist Church read on her behalf. At this time, I cannot fully explain what happened to me last week. I had a host of compelling issues which seemed out of control, issues for which I was unable to address or confine. Please may I assure you that my running away had nothing to do with cold feet, nor was it ever about leaving John. I thank you for every expression of support and effort your sacrifices of time and personal inconvenience touched me deeply. I truly hope your spirit of care is not lessened. I understand that many people wanted to hear from me personally today, and I wanted to be here. However, I look forward to the days ahead when I am strong enough to speak for myself. Each day, I'm understanding more about who I am and the issues that have influenced me to respond inappropriately. Therefore, I have started professional treatment voluntarily. I am sorry for the troubles I caused, and I offer my deep and sincere apology. When she got back, we talked about, all right, what do we do now? I said, well, you've got to get some help. She remained secluded at Joyce's home in Gainesville before being admitted into an inpatient program on May 9th. A statement to the press was released the next day, this time delivered by Sammy Smith, another pastor from Lakewood. Ms. Wilbanks entered a highly regarded inpatient treatment program on her own volition to address physical and mental issues which she believes played a major role in her running from herself. Updates on her condition will be announced at a later time, as approved by medical personnel and her attorney. The facility and type of treatment program that Jennifer was admitted to was never disclosed, though Jennifer would state she was excessively medicated during her time there. Jennifer remains vague and evasive on the issue in the Couric interview. We're not supposed to put labels on it. Jennifer suggests a history of suicidal ideation and notes that she'd contemplated suicide as an alternative to fleeing. I had a bottle of pills. Or I had the bus ticket. He talks about a bottle of pills. You say you had a bottle of pills. But never elaborates further. And I decided not to play God that day. So I got on that bus. When watching Jennifer in her only voluntary on-camera interview, 
It bears repeating that Jennifer is now undergoing inpatient psychiatric treatment, but was given a weekend pass during which she sat down for this interview. One compelling piece of collateral information that made its way out came from Jennifer's twin brother, Matthew. In a New York Post article, Matthew gave his first public interview following the scandal. And while it's highly unlikely that the headline, My Sis Jen's a Runaway Thief, is a direct quote, Matthew did note, She's done some things that an average person would not do. She's had issues prior to this event, and she's nowhere near healthy. It finally caught up to her. Matthew describes himself as the goody two-shoes of the two, and Jennifer as having more of a social life, which he says played a part in their diverging paths in life. Matthew felt in his gut that his twin sister was still alive while she was missing, and didn't feel a staged disappearance was beyond the pale. Uh, I just, I just felt, I, I felt pretty good that uh, I was worried. Don't get me wrong, but I, I felt like she would show up somehow, and. Uh, and uh, I even told a couple of people, and then, I mean, this, this is going to sound crazy too, but I, I just I told a couple of people I thought she might call today. I was so worried about my mom and dad. If, if we got some uh, terrible, terrible news, I was, just, I was just worried about them making it through it. He added, I don't believe she planned it. She just maybe thought, the story has to be really detailed and elaborate to be believable. The article which cites several other unnamed sources, suggest a pattern of compulsive lying and stealing, including anonymous allegations she stole clothing from babysitting jobs she'd worked at. One named source reported to be the father of an ex-boyfriend of Jennifer. He claimed she'd become obsessed with him after he broke up with her, to the point she began to stalk him for a time. Other anonymous claims include an addiction to plastic surgery, which extended to breast augmentation, and the eye lift that purports to account for her wide gaze. On April 29, 2005, at around 11.30 p.m. in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Jennifer Wilbanks turned up outside the 7-Eleven at 3801 Central Avenue. Walking up to a pair of payphones, Jennifer first called her mother's home on one phone before dialing 911 on the other. There are a number of illustrative moments throughout, so let's start with the collect call to Gainesville, which was initially answered by Jennifer's father-in-law, Roger Parrish. Right here. Cody, where are you? I don't know. A man and a woman had me. Are you sure you're not in Duluth? No, I'm not in Duluth. Are you in Georgia? Okay, that's okay, sweetie, it's okay. We're just trying to figure out how to come find you. <laughs> they cut your hair? And that's all they did to you? Well, that's great. She sees a dog on the It was a man and a... In the first call, Jennifer has already established that her abductors were a Hispanic male and a Caucasian female, a phrase she would repeat verbatim. Jennifer repeatedly seeks out permission and guidance to the point she needs Roger's approval before calling 911. Albuquerque 911, operator 44, emergency. I'm at the, um, I don't know where I am. I'm right here beside the Walnut Street at the 7-Eleven. Okay, what's going on? I've got my family and the police on the phone. I was I was kidnapped earlier this week, and I'm here now, and I'm here now. What happened? I was, I was kidnapped from, my, from Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know. My, my parents said it's been on the knees. I don't know. And who did this to you? I don't know. Did they just drop you off right now? No, they didn't. They didn't know how long ago it was. They didn't drop me off here. It was away from here, back home. That is great. I mean, I can show them, but I don't know that I don't know where I am. Okay. <laughs> and the person that did this to you, was he a healer? He? <laughs> it was an Hispanic man and a Caucasian woman. Okay. And the, the male. But it happened. It happened in Duluth. Okay. And the male that did this is he black, white, Hispanic, or Native American? Hispanic. Okay. About how old? <laughs> I was. I think they're. I mean, I would say in their forties, maybe. What is his weight? Do you think approximately? Then, how do you medium build? It was medium build, yeah. I don't, I don't know. What color of hair did he have? Black. Was it long or short? Short. Did he have any facial hair? No. What color shirt exactly was he wearing when we last saw him? 
And he had on a maroon jacket, and I don't know what color shirt under it. What color was his pants? Blue jeans. And what kind of vehicle was he driving? It was a blue van, like a, a dark van. Was it a conversion van or a small minivan? It, it wasn't a minivan. It was like a, like a, paint, like a paint or work van. Having weapons on them? <laughs> yeah. And they, they have just a, a small handgun. What direction did they leave in? Uh -huh. I, I, I have no idea. I don't even know where I am. Look at the dark blue conversion now. No, it was a lighter blue. Did you see anything Now, a man who saw Will Banks make the call to police in Albuquerque he says he was afraid of her at first. John Flores was about to run to a 7-Eleven near his home when he spotted Will Banks. He thought she was homeless. Then she walked up to a payphone. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. I, I was waiting. So, that, you know, I didn't want to get approached by anybody on this because there's a lot of people on the street. So then I came over here and got something to drink. And as I left, she was still on the phone. It didn't hit me at that time, you know. But then when I saw it on CNN, uh, her picture, I said, man, that's, that's her. I'm sure it had to be her because this is description from what I saw and matched perfectly. You know? Officer Verbeck was the first to make contact with Jennifer, while officers Feist and Jaunty soon arrived. They took information on the blue conversion van, with Officer Verbeck noting that Jennifer was not able to give a good description of the van. She stated the male had raped her one time and that she had not been harmed or restrained in any way. Officer Vervek and John D. proceeded to patrol the area for the van, while Officer Feist brought her to the Albuquerque Police Department's Southeast Substation. It was at this police substation where Jennifer Wilbanks was questioned by FBI agents. She was brought here around midnight. Jennifer first met with the sexual assault nurse examiner and completed a rape kit. Because Jennifer was the subject of a high-profile missing persons case, agents of the FBI field office soon arrived to interview Jennifer, the Albuquerque PD, follow-up on the sexual assault. Jennifer was interviewed for an hour by the FBI, and the following is a summary of her account to them. While out jogging Tuesday evening, Jennifer was abruptly grabbed by the interracial couple, thrown into the back of their van and tied up. Jennifer was kept lying on her right side facing the rear door while the female stayed back with her. They drove for about half an hour before pulling over. The female pulled Jennifer's pants and underwear down and began performing oral sex on her along with digital penetration. The female then took off her own bottoms, placed her legs over Jennifer's face and told her, now you can lick my pussy. At this point, the male began performing intercourse on her. This went on until the female reached orgasm, at which point the male withdrew. Jennifer was unsure if the male ejaculated or if he wore a condom. She denied the male was forceful, but added that there was no foreplay on his part. And who took your clothes off? She did. Did you resist at that point when they were trying to take your clothes off? Not to a great extent. I just, you know, so please don't, I, I said please don't do this, but I didn't put up a fight. Did you it, feel any pain? It was uncomfortable. Yes, yeah, ma'am. But it wasn't, uh, you know, they weren't beating me or anything like that. There was no further sexual activity, but the couple kept Jennifer captive in the back of the van. They would drive on, periodically stopping for gas and fast food for three days until dropping her off after they determined they couldn't get any more money out of her. As the interview went on, they began to challenge Jennifer on inconsistencies in her story. She became increasingly upset and flustered. Police say it wasn't until about 4 o'clock this morning that she admitted she had concocted this elaborate hoax about being abducted. Jennifer, I think something happened. And he said, I just can't do this on Saturday. No, it's okay. Is that, is that what, it, what happened? I just cracked under all this pressure. And I was like, what am I going to do? Friday's the only day. I've got to, that's the rehearsal dinner. I've got to get my pedicure manicure done. I've got to pack for this honeymoon. I don't even know where I'm going. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, there's no absolute way I'm going to get all this done. I just cracked under all this pressure. And I, I just, 
I mean, I couldn't do it all. I couldn't and have the perfect wedding that everybody thought that I was supposed to have. Mm -hmm. I love John. I just, it wasn't even, it was just about the stupid wedding. She also noted meeting a Hispanic male and Caucasian female during the bus trip, but denied anything untoward had occurred between them. So can we read anything into the unnecessarily extraneous details of Jennifer's abduction and assault story? Why was the female the primary sexual aggressor, and the male relatively submissive to her? Um, maybe I've watched too many cops and robbers movies. I Experts from the psychoanalytical school of thought might be inclined to suggest a repressed sexuality or a subconscious fantasy of turning the tables on traditional gender roles. But a more likely explanation could be that Jennifer, mindful of her own and or John's high valuation of chastity, was fearful that John would see her as damaged and hoped to avoid involving a sexual component. As she realized her story would seem more implausible without this motive, she likely sought to elaborate in a way that would be least threatening to John as possible. The FBI conducted a follow-up interview with Jennifer on May 4th at Joyce and Rogers' home in Gainesville where she was sequestering from the media. They learned that Joyce was actively managing 32-year-old Jennifer's banking at the time. Because of this, Jennifer knew she would be unable to use her debit card without her mom being able to track her, and a large withdrawal would raise suspicion. So she took out $40 from an ATM earlier in the evening before disappearing. She was able to round up about $100 by closing out an old credit union account and another $100 by cashing in a cell phone rebate check. She left for her jog with her bus ticket to Austin, $240 in cash, a pair of scissors, and an iPod. She ran a few blocks before cutting nearly a foot of her hair off and catching a taxi near the library to the Greyhound Depot near Atlanta International Airport. It's unclear how much of the world outside the greater Atlanta area Jennifer had seen at 32, but by the time she reached Dallas, the unfamiliar environments she'd traveled through left her fearful to leave the bus. It just seemed like it would be safe for me to be on a bus. It's somewhere in this leg of the trip that she meets the Hispanic male with rotting teeth and heavyset Caucasian woman who, as it turns out, saw Jennifer was visibly distressed and offered her a candy bar. She arrived in Austin with no lodging arrangements and, still feeling unsafe, opted instead to buy another Greyhound ticket to Las Vegas. She went to three hotel casinos but found them all to be unaffordable. A pit boss at Treasure Island, Frank Sidoris, spotted Jennifer and later gave an interview with Fox News. Recalling a stretch of budget motels she'd seen while going through New Mexico, Jennifer bought a third bus ticket back to Albuquerque. She had a coupon for $19.99 a night at one motel, but didn't have enough money to cover the full cab ride, so she ended up getting dropped off near the 7-Eleven on Central Avenue. Out of cash, she made the collect call to her mom's home. While John Mason continued to engage with media following her disappearance and return, Jennifer's only on-camera interview took place into her inpatient stay. Which has been going on for six weeks now. Jennifer would later claim she was heavily impaired by medication when she gave John power of attorney. In the heavily edited interview, she appears lucid and oriented, though given the intensity of what she'd gone through in the weeks prior and her difficulty with distress tolerance, her relatively flat affect could be a combination of medication, post-shock emotional numbness, and a passiveness with the aim of getting the experience over with. The NBC primetime special was an effort in damage control for the couple and must-see TV for the network. It was in no way a Jennifer Tells All, and at the same time, really leaves no teases to entice the audience to read a book for the rest of the story. It's clear NBC's agenda was ad revenue gold in the form of an exclusive in a bizarre story that had saturated popular culture. Katie Couric gets to serve as stand-in for women, asking questions that seem tough. Some people feel that this was extraordinarily selfish of you. But are never actually challenging or confronting. So the longer it went on, in a way, the harder it was to face what you had done and face them and John. Right. Aside from reinforcing his absolvement of any wrongdoing in Jennifer's disappearance, John Mason seems to emphasize his loyalty, compassion, and support for Jennifer. I mean, you never wavered in your commitment to her. Mm. Never even thought twice about it. Though arguably he presents as less than bright, and by extension, 
a bit of a chump. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me uh, why you've gotten that reputation in, in your youth as being a, a bit of a party animal. Why I got that reputation? Because it was true. Because <laughs> you I earned guess. it. Yeah, right, because it was true. <laughs> Jennifer, for her part, does little to sway most viewers' preconceived notions about her by remaining demure and passive. She looks to John repeatedly for validation, approval, or sometimes hoping for him to tag in. What would you say to those people right now who are watching this? I tell them, please be patient. Um. John appears equally watchful of Jennifer throughout. She appears to be walking a tightrope of shutting down speculation, reclaiming some of the narrative as best she can, and appearing penitent while appeasing John. She gives answers that appear scripted at times. Jennifer is visibly hesitant to volunteer any more details than necessary over her criminal past and passively goes along with the cry for help explanation provided. They often say, Jennifer, and I'm sure you both know this, that committing this kind of crime isn't about the stuff. Cry for help. Right. Other questions tend to be leading and closed-ended. So pretty soon after you all met, you knew that this was the real deal. Was that a cry for help? And was anyone listening? Were you seriously considering suicide? Was it just impulsive? Um, Taking further burden off Jennifer to elaborate. Why? Why? As a result, she isn't really humanized enough to override the two-dimensional media version of the runaway bride. But ultimately, a sanitized version of the story with implications of a tidy ending mutually benefited NBC and the couple. Jennifer reportedly ran in the Chicago Marathon that October, but did not engage with the media during the event. By May 2006, John and Jennifer separated. John evicted her from the home he'd purchased with the $500,000 Regan Media deal. Jennifer filed a lawsuit against John for half the money, plus $250,000 in punitive damages. John countersued. The two dropped their respective lawsuits and parted ways. On March 15, 2008, John married Shelley Martin at his parents' home in Duluth. Meanwhile, Jennifer began dating landscape designer Greg Hudson, and their engagement in 2010 made the tabloids, eager to speculate on whether the runaway bride will finally make it down the aisle. At the time, Jennifer was said to be carrying over $30,000 in debt, much of it from charge cards to stores like Kohl's, Victoria's Secret, and Old Navy. Jennifer and Greg did eventually marry November 17, 2017. According to court documents, the two separated by January 3rd of 2020. Jennifer represented herself pro se for the divorce proceedings, despite advisements from the court, and did not appear to contest any of the filings. Jennifer received a cash settlement and one car. Today, Jennifer continues to live in Georgia. She has worked in human resources management since 2015. Considering how quickly the news of the runaway bride getting engaged and divorced gets picked up, and despite the potential profitability from a new scandal, some kind of celebrity second life, or a tell-all, she has consistently chosen to avoid the spotlight since that time. Have they told you it's depression or panic disorder or anxiety right. all of the above have they so they've diagnosed you with anything specifically the specifics of her highly regarded inpatient program have never been voluntarily released and would otherwise be protected by hipaa laws one aspect of the story that paints jennifer in an especially unfavorable light was her decision to claim one of her abductors was hispanic tapping into a long tradition in the U.S. of white people falsely demonizing minorities for their own aims. In the case of Sherry Papini, her racism was much more overt, to the extent she unequivocally expressed appreciation and admiration of skinheads. Having based her description off a couple she'd met on the bus who offered her food, it's less clear if Jennifer was racially biased or just pulled a vaguely dick move with no way of foreseeing the optics of it. Until she comes out and apologizes to our community, we're not going to let go. So what could she possibly have been thinking? Was she running from the pressures of a lavish wedding? I wasn't feeling pressure from everyone because it was exactly what I wanted. Fears she could never live up to John Mason's standards as a wife. Did you ever talk to anyone, Jennifer, about how you were feeling? I wouldn't have come to you under any circumstances, no matter what. Was she running from herself? That's what I've always done. That's what's comfortable to me. And if so, what was it in the mirror that she couldn't face? 
or was it all a twisted ploy for attention? I wish, I, I wish you were interviewing me because I had won American Idol, not because of this. One thing to come out of the runaway bride story was a conversation on the increasingly mercenary wedding industry. By 2005, the total annual revenue for the wedding services in the U.S. had topped $50 billion. Jennifer initially cited the pressures of coordinating such a large event as her motivation to take off. I just cracked under all this pressure. But recanted this excuse by the time she returned to Georgia. Interestingly, the FBI's follow-up interview with Jennifer on May 4th notes that even though she had been in a relationship with Mason since August 2004, she kept I love you text messages on her cell phone from another man she dated in 2003. If there is truth to Jennifer's statement that she was ultimately running from herself, it's less clear about what herself she was running from. As a media figure, she's been largely defined by the wedding she dipped out on, but sometimes taking a step back can reveal other possibilities to consider. Jennifer was a high academic and athletic achiever in high school. The teachers still there who taught her spoke highly of her, preferring to stay off camera. They each said Jennifer was a cheerleader briefly and was a good and energetic member of the basketball and cross country teams running long distance to this day. I was very, very concerned like a lot of other people were when she came missing. Uh, and then when they found her and then it took the strange twist it did, that's just totally out of character. She had the confidence in the scholastic record to pursue a goal of medical school when she took biology prerequisites at the University of Georgia in Athens. What did you study there? I started off uh, pre-med with biology. In the Couric interview, Jennifer half-heartedly and vaguely touches on what led up to her dropping out. And I guess caught up with the, in the social scene. Overall, she downplays the significance of this experience to her beyond being an early example of running from herself. Whatever role priorities or insecurities played in her dropping out, she appeared to somewhat fairly thrive working at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, even as a paraprofessional. An example of Jennifer's pattern of dishonesty cited in the New York Post article comes from an unnamed source who states that Jennifer would often insinuate or sometimes even tell people that she was a nurse, likely using her work scrubs to support this. According to her LinkedIn profile, Jennifer attended from 1991 to 1996. We see her pattern of shoplifting immediately follows, alongside her first engagement with no similar behaviors reported since. While we still don't know when or why Joyce took over her daughter's finances, we can see in the arrest reports that Jennifer lived independently during those years. By April 2005, she was cohabitating with John Mason in Duluth, but was using her mother's address on her driver's license, according to the Albuquerque police report. She also plays up her stated goal of becoming a mother in the Couric interview, although she lets slip that this was Joyce's goal. What did you dream about? I dreamed of... I mean, if you want to know the truth, my mom has said this. She thinks that I was put on this earth to be a mom. And is only shown following up this thread with an unserious anecdote about the likelihood of her committing kidnapping. They better check my bags before I leave to make sure I didn't have any of the babies with me. It might be easy to assume that, at 32, Jennifer felt some sense of urgency to start a family with John. Because we are older. In the end, Jennifer would never become a mother herself. She never commented on whether or not she'd considered adoption. Jennifer may or may not truly know herself what she was really running from on April 26, 2005. But at the same time, it's the best mistake I ever made. Okay. I've laid out the facts of the case of the runaway bride, but from here, the rest of Jennifer Wilbank's story is hers alone to choose to tell or not to tell. Thanks for watching.